Good evening and happy Sabbath, ASI. It's a privilege to be with you all. This evening we're going to be looking at a specific series of events in Christ's life uh, that is referred to in Revelation chapter 14 as the faith of Jesus, some events that I think most clearly depict this. And I believe that this is one of the most powerful and life-transforming stories that any of us will ever encounter uh, when we take the time to reflect and sit at the foot of the cross. And I would encourage each of us as we're listening this evening and going through this to be praying throughout the length of this message, God, speak to me. God, I don't want the cross to be this common thing that I've heard for years. I want to encounter it afresh tonight. And so I invite you to join me as we pray. Sweet Jesus, thank you for this privilege to come into your presence. Thank you that I believe you have a blessing in store for us this evening. And I'm just asking, oh God, that you would do something in this place, in this very moment, that none of us would soon forget, for your glory's sake. And as Moses prayed, I pray, O God, that you would show us your glory. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Time doesn't permit me to uh, be able to give you all the references that we'll be using this evening, but the narrative for this evening's story is drawn largely from the four Gospels, Isaiah chapter 53, Psalm 22, Psalm 18, uh, multiple chapters in Desire of Ages, Gethsemane, Calvary, and It Is Finished, and the second volume of the testimony is a chapter entitled The Sufferings of Christ. But we're told in the 1888 materials that the want or the need in the religious experience is the acceptance of Jesus Christ as presented in the gospel. This is what people are looking for in their Christian experience, and this is what our people desperately need. Uh, Jesus tells us in Luke chapter 19 and verse 10 that the Son of Man came to seek and to save that which was lost. And this applies a few things. The first is it implies that Jesus saw value in the thing that he's seeking. He saw something of value in what he's pursuing. But the second thing that is implied is that he's the one taking about the initiative to bring about the solution, even though we are in a horrible condition. We're told in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 21 that God made Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ. Notice, Jesus did not simply write a check for the price of sin. He literally became sin. He became the embodiment of our sin, and he received the wrath of God towards our sin to set us free. But what does that look like, and what does that teach us about the faith of Jesus? We'll be spending the rest of our time this evening unpacking that very thing. Desire of Ages tells us this, that in John chapter 13 to 17, Jesus had been earnestly conversing with his disciples and instructing them. But as he neared Gethsemane, he became strangely silent. He had often visited this spot for meditation and prayer, but never with a heart so full of sorrow as upon this night of his last agony. Throughout his life on earth, Jesus had walked in the light of God's presence. This is an important theme throughout this message. But when in conflict with men who were inspired by the very spirit of Satan, he could say, He that sent me is with me. The Father hath not left me alone, for I do always those things that please him. But now he seemed to be shut out from the light of God's sustaining presence. Now he was numbered with the transgressors. The guilt of fallen humanity he must bear. And she's referring to the the Garden of Gethsemane. Upon him who knew no sin must be laid the iniquity of us all. So dreadfully does sin appear to him, so great is the weight of guilt which he must bear, that he is tempted to fear that it will shut him out forever from his Father's love. Feeling how terrible is the wrath of God against transgression, he exclaims, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful even to death. And as they approached the garden, the disciples had marked the change that came over their master. Never before had they seen him so utterly sad and silent. 
And as he proceeded, this strange sadness deepened, yet they dared not question him as to the cause. They don't even have the courage to ask him why. And his form swayed as if he were about to fall. Upon reaching the garden, the disciples looked anxiously for his usual place of retirement that their master might rest. Every step that he now took was with labored effort, and he groaned aloud. Jesus wails in this moment, as if suffering under the pressure of a terrible burden. Twice his companions supported him, or he would have fallen to the earth. Jesus' legs literally give out from under him in this moment, and the disciples have to catch him, or he will fall to the ground. And it happens twice. He felt that by sin he was being separated from his father. The gulf was so broad, so black, so deep, that his spirit shuddered before it. In this agony, he must not exert his divine power to escape. As man, he must suffer the consequences of man's sin. And as a man, he must endure the wrath of God against transgression." So Jesus here now is standing in a completely different attitude from that in which he had ever stood before. And as the substitute and surety for sinful man, Christ was suffering under divine justice. He saw what justice meant. Hitherto, he had been an intercessor for others. But now he longed to have an intercessor for himself. I wish somebody would pray for me. I've given and given and given, but right now I need somebody else to give. And he gets nothing. And the psychological agony that Jesus is going through is so intense that physiologically he begins to bleed through his pores. Now, you and I, under these similar circumstances, we kind of have this infrastructure built within us. And anyone who's worked in a trauma setting can vouch for this, that we just check out. Right? We kind of get that thousand-yard stare, and the lights are on, but no one's home. Right? And we can have these circumstances where emotionally we can just shut down because it's too intense. But Jesus doesn't have that option. And Jesus has to suffer, and He suffers alone. Back to Desire of Ages. But what was to be gained by this sacrifice? How hopeless appeared the guilt and ingratitude of men. In its hardest features, Satan pressed the situation upon the Redeemer. The people who claim to be above all others in temporal and spiritual advantages have rejected you, Jesus. They're seeking to destroy you. One of your own disciples who's listened to your instruction and has been among the foremost in church activities will betray you. One of your most zealous followers, zealous followers will deny you. All will forsake you. Christ's whole being abhorred the thought that those whom he had undertaken to save, those whom he had loved so much, should unite in the plots of Satan. This pierced his soul. The conflict was terrible, and the sins of men weighed heavily upon Christ, and the sense of God's wrath against sin was literally crushing out his life. Behold Jesus contemplating the price to be paid for the human soul. In his agony, he clings to the cold ground as if to prevent himself from being drawn any further from God. <laughs> you know, the human soul longs for suffering, we're told, longs for sympathy in suffering. <laughs> and this longing Christ felt to the very depths of his being. In the supreme agony of his soul, he came to the disciples with a yearning desire to hear some words of comfort from those whom he had so often blessed and comforted and shielded in sorrow and distress. Right? Just to crawl across that gravel and lay a hand on his shoulder and tell him, Jesus, we're here. They can't tell him it's going to be okay. It's not going to be okay. The one who had always words of sympathy for them was now suffering superhuman agony. And he longed to know that they were praying for him and for themselves. Were they? How dark seemed the malignity of sin. 
terrible was the temptation to let the human race bear the consequences of its own guilt while he stood innocent before God. Jesus is strongly tempted in this moment to leave us. This experience for him is overwhelmingly unfamiliar. And if he could only know that his disciples understood and appreciated this, he would be strengthened. But did they? So was he strengthened? No. So Jesus prays three agonizing prayers to the Father to be delivered from this crippling call, begging the Father to change his mind. And the cup that he's referring to here, Father, let this cup pass from me, is the same cup mentioned in Revelation chapter 14 in the second angel's message. It's the cup of God's unmingled wrath. We're told in the second volume of the testimonies that it's in this moment that Jesus was realizing the Father's frown. <laughs> what happened to this is my beloved Son, and you I am well pleased. In this moment, he's sensing and realizing his Father's frown. He had taken the cup of suffering from the lips of guilty man and proposed to drink it himself, and in its place give to man the cup of blessing. The wrath that would have fallen upon man was now falling upon Christ, and it was here that the mysterious cup trembles in his hand. The sins of a lost world are upon him and overwhelming him. And she says it again, it was a sense of his father's frown. In consequence of sin, which rent Jesus' heart with such piercing agony, and it forced from his brow great drops of blood, which rolling down from his pale cheeks, fell to the ground, moistening the earth. Guys, the unmingled wrath of God is being poured out upon God. It's a seeming contradiction in terms. And as he's pleading with the Father, please, let this cup pass from me. Your face comes into the mind of Jesus. And this is what gives him the intrinsic motivation to even say the words, nevertheless. Not my will, but yours be done. But then his humanity shrinks from this responsibility again and says, Father, please, if there's any other way, let me be spared. But he's reminded of our fate again. And he says, nevertheless, if this is what it takes, I'll do it. One last time, he shrinks from this responsibility and surrenders a third time. And then we're told in this moment in Desire of Ages, page 690, that his decision is made. And he will save man at any cost to himself. Amen. No matter how much it hurts, no matter how much I struggle, no matter how agonizing this may be, lay it on me. I don't care what it costs. For their sakes, lay it on me. And we're told that he's not the only one suffering in this moment. God suffered with his son, and there was silence in heaven. Heaven is not a place that's known for being silent. Just read the book of Revelation. But could mortals have viewed the amazement of the angelic hosts as in silent grief they watched the Father separating His beams of light, love, and glory from His beloved Son? They would better understand how offensive in His sight is sin. If we saw what they saw, we would not do what we do. Amen. And then God has to send an angel from the right hand of his throne down to planet earth to do for Jesus what Peter, James, and John did not do. And it's this touching and heartbreaking picture in Desire of Ages in the Gethsemane chapter where literally this angel stoops down behind Jesus, beside Jesus and cradles his head in his bosom and speaks tender words of encouragement to him, reminding him of the promises of God. Jesus, you will see the labor of your soul and be satisfied. Remember when he said that this is my beloved son and him I am well pleased, it's still true. 
And the disciples awaken and they look across the courtyard. It's alluded to in Luke's account too. But they look across the courtyard and they see this glowing angelic being cradling Jesus and pointing to heaven. What is implied by what we're seeing here when Jesus tells the disciples that my soul's exceedingly sorrowful even to death is that he would never have made it out of that garden were it not for the fact that this angel is sent to strengthen him. But then as they go down to the entrance of the gate of the garden, there's this group of brute guards and a mob with implements that they're not going to need for Jesus because he's a man of peace. Judas is leading this group, and Jesus is betrayed by a kiss. And as a stab of heartbreak is going through his heart, Jesus musters the unselfish love to refer to this man as friend. Friend. Some of us have people in our life right now that we cannot refer to as friend because they took too much, they went too far, and I just can't. In His strength, you can We're not asking you to return to abusive circumstances. We're not even asking that this person has to be brought back into your life in a day-to-day interaction or so forth. But what we are saying is the disposition of your heart can change towards that individual by God's grace. Then Peter has a brilliant idea, and he hacks Malchus's ear off, (laughs) thinking he's doing Jesus a favor. And Peter, Jesus tells him, put your sword in its place, Peter. I don't need your violence to defend my kingdom. I can handle it. They aren't taking my life. I'm giving myself for them. (laughs) Then Jesus is given this sham of a trial where the word justice isn't even invited to the conversation. We're told in Isaiah chapter 52 that as a result of this trial, Jesus is beaten beyond the point of recognition. You cannot recognize who this man is when they're done with him. And then he's brought before the Jews. And what do they have to say about the man that's come to save them? We will not have this man as Lord over us. We have no king but Caesar. And give us Barabbas. And we think to ourselves, what savages? What monsters to say such a thing? But before we're too hard on the Jews, we need to come face to face with the fact that every time you and I choose our choice sins over Jesus, we're saying the exact same thing. I will not have this man as Lord over me. I have no king but Caesar. And give me Barabbas. I'm no better than them. I'm no better. All of us, were it not for the grace of God, deserve to die because of our sins but we have the grace of God. Amen? Then comes the next moment of Christ's vulnerability in His life that I think is the most profound. Jesus says in Matthew chapter 16 and verse 24 that if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. You remember that text? You familiar with that? It dawned on me about a year ago, what did it look like when He took up His? because He's asking us to follow Him. Well, John 19, 17 tells us that Jesus, bearing His own cross, went out to a place called the place of a skull, which is called in Hebrew, Golgotha. But in Matthew 27, it says, now as they came out, they found a man of Cyrene, Simon by name, him they compelled to bear Jesus' cross. I have a very important question for you today. Does Scripture contradict itself, yes or no? No. These are not statements of contradiction. They're statements of chronology. Desire of Ages picks up on this. As Jesus passed the gate of Pilate's court, the cross that had been prepared for Barabbas was placed upon his bruised and bleeding shoulders. Two companions of Barabbas were to suffer death at the same time with Jesus, and upon them also crosses were placed. But the Savior's burden was too heavy for him in his weak and suffering condition, 
Since the Passover supper with his disciples, he had taken neither food nor drink. He had agonized in the Garden of Gethsemane in conflict with satanic agencies. He had endured the anguish of the betrayal and had seen his disciples forsake him and flee. He had been taken to Annas, then to Caiaphas, and then to Pilate. From Pilate he had been sent to Herod and then sent again to Pilate. From insult to renewed insult, from mockery to mockery, twice tortured by the scourge. All that night there had been scene after scene of a character to try the soul of man to the uttermost. But Christ had not failed. He had spoken no word but that tended to glorify God. All through the disgraceful farce of a trial, he had borne himself with firmness and dignity. But when after the second scourging, the cross was laid upon him, human nature could bear no more, and he fell fainting beneath the burden. The crowd that followed the Savior saw his weak and staggering steps, but they manifested no compassion. They taunted and reviled him because he could not carry the heavy cross. And again the burden was laid upon him, and again he fell fainting to the ground, and his persecutors saw that it was impossible for Jesus to carry his burden farther. They were puzzled to find anyone who would bear this humiliating load. The Jews themselves could not do this because the defilement would prevent them from keeping the Passover. None even of the mob that followed him could stoop to bear the cross. And now is when Simon steps in. And it turned out to be a blessing for Simon. This ends up being his means of conversion. But the question was, if Jesus is asking us to take up our cross and follow him, what's that going to look like? You're going to collapse. It's going to be too much. And you're not going to be able to carry the burden. And that's the point, guys. You were never meant to carry that burden. And Jesus had to be humiliated and collapse under the weight of his cross to make it clear to you that you're not a loser when you collapse under yours. It wasn't your weight to begin with. He will carry that weight for us, and that's the point. So if you had to go through the agonizing and humiliating effort to carry the cross that you've been given, only to collapse under its load, you have a Savior who understands today. We have to come face to face with the reality that we cannot bear that cross that we've been given, and we need help from a source outside of us. And Jesus humiliated himself to give us that example. But then he's nailed to this demonic torture device, and as they lift the cross in the air and slam it into the hole in the ground that's prepared for it, every nerve and sinew of his body has fire running through it. But then we're told this strange line that his physical pain was, quote unquote, hardly felt in comparison with the psychological and emotional agony that he's going through and the spiritual agony. Then all this unbelief is heaped at Jesus. If you're the Son of God, save yourself. If you're the Son of God, save yourself and us. An irony of ironies is precisely because Jesus is the Son of God that he's not coming down from that cross. And he's already saving them. They just haven't figured it out yet. And this voice of sophistry returns telling him, Jesus, these people don't appreciate you. You are wasting your time, man. And yet Jesus persists and continues. But the only constant that Jesus has had for 33 and a half years is the presence and the approval of his Father. And in this moment, that's gone. Radio silence. Jesus now is enduring the deafening silence of God. And words come out of the mouth of Jesus in this moment that you do not expect to hear from God Himself. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And this is a direct quote. We're getting into the faith of Jesus now. This is a direct quote from Psalm chapter 22 and verse 1. And to the onlookers, it seems as though Jesus has lost faith. But if you're familiar with this chapter, there's a point of transition in the middle, in verse 21. As as Jesus is pouring out His heart and praying and not getting answers, then it says, you have heard me. Then in verse 24, 
The psalm transitions and ends with praise. Verse 24, it says, He has not despised nor abhorred the affliction of the afflicted, nor has He hidden His face from Him, but when He cried, He heard. And in verse 27, all the ends of the world shall remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nations shall worship before you. And this is what Jesus said would happen in John 12, 32, that I, if I be lifted up, will draw all peoples to myself. But that word peoples is supplied. It's bigger than that. It's not even just this earth that's drawn to Jesus at the cross. It's the unfallen worlds and the unfallen angels are even more drawn to Him when they see what He's willing to pay for the salvation of man. But the darkness that Jesus is experiencing in His closing hours was eclipsing what Jesus said in John 12. And so Jesus had to persevere through faith to believe what God had said previously in His life and what His Word had said. The faith of Jesus pierces through this darkness and claims and takes hold of the Father's love, even though He does not feel it. So Jesus didn't just happen to memorize Psalm 22 and verse 1, just in case, you know, stuff gets nasty someday. His whole life was filled with the reality of God's presence, and now He's feeling devoid of it, but Jesus had memorized the whole chapter. And so when Jesus quotes verse 1, though it looks like defeat, Jesus is also claiming all the way through the end of the chapter, which ends with victory. It is finished. And it's Jesus' faith that pierces through this darkness, and He rests in His Father's love even when He can't feel it. Do you ever wonder why it is that it looks like midnight, even though it's noonday at the cross? We're told in Desire of Ages 753 that in that thick darkness, God's presence was hidden. He makes darkness His pavilion, and He conceals His glory from human eyes. God and His holy angels were beside the cross. This is alluded to in Psalm 18, by the way. The Father was with His Son, yet His presence was not revealed. And had His glory flashed forth from the cloud, every human beholder would have been destroyed. Even in this moment, the mercy and the justice of God kiss together at the cross, because even these people that you and I would think deserve to die are being shown mercy and grace they do not deserve. Why? So they can respond to the faith of Jesus, because God wants them saved just as much as He wants you saved. We're not better than them. We're just as guilty as them, by the way. And in that dreadful hour, Christ was not to be comforted with the Father's presence, he trod the winepress alone, and of the people, there was none with him. And you know why? Because there's times when you and I tread the winepress alone, and there's no one with us. And we're told in Hebrews 4 that we have a high priest who can sympathize with us in our weaknesses. Why? So we therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Jesus went through this just for you. Hebrews 2 and Hebrews 4 tells us this. So what keeps Jesus going through all this madness and chaos? You know what it was? It's you. It's you. Jesus cannot bear the thought of losing you. It is unthinkable to Him. We're told in another place that heaven was not a place to be desired while we were lost. Jesus would rather risk His eternal existence and be lost forever for you to have a chance to be saved than to remain in the safety and security of His Father's presence and us not to have a chance. And that also is the faith of Jesus. Jesus sees something in you that you don't even see in yourself, and He treats you as if that were true. Why? To awaken within you a desire to live a life that would honor such a sacrifice. And in this moment, as Jesus is enduring the deafening silence of God and is hurting beyond belief, He is fully convinced in His mind that when He breathes His last breath, He will never see the light of day again. He will never see the Father again. And even if this whole plan of salvation does work and you're saved, He's not going to be there to see it. 
He cannot see through the portals of the tomb, we're told. Why would he do this? John 13 tells us that having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end, to the very end of himself, to the very end of his existence. And God, in his great mercy and love for you, Jesus is going to love you to the end of your ability to choose for the right. He loves you to the end. And the word love there is agape. An other-centered love that does not wait for a response and does not give because it will get a response. It gives, period. Because that's what love does. It gives. Desire of Ages 76 tells us this about the faith of Jesus. Amidst the awful darkness, apparently forsaken of God, Christ had drained the last dregs in the cup of human woe. In those dreadful hours, he had relied upon the evidence of his father's acceptance heretofore given him, because he's not feeling it right now. He was acquainted with the character of his father. He understood his justice, his mercy, and his great love. And by faith, he rested in him whom it had ever been his joy to obey. And as in submission, he committed himself to God, the, sin, uh, the sense of the loss of his father's favor was withdrawn. And by faith, Christ was victor. That's the faith of Jesus. And God's people at the end of time don't just have and keep the commandments of God. They also have the faith of Jesus. The time of crisis to come upon this earth will bring us through our own Gethsemane experience. We will be challenged very deeply. Was it all true? Does God still love me? Is God still here in my darkest moment when hope doesn't seem to present itself? What will we do in that moment? The faith of Jesus is what will see us through. Amen. But then Jesus ascends to heaven after his resurrection to see if the sacrifice was sufficient. And we're told that the angels erupt in praise. You have never seen a worship service like this in your life. And Jesus looks at the angels and he says, no, no. He will not accept their worship. And he presses, and just think about this. He spent 33 and a half years being unloved and unappreciated by the people on this earth, and forsaken of the company of the only people in the cosmos who do understand and appreciate Him. You think Jesus' love tank is probably pretty empty at this stage. But when He receives the praise and adoration He deserves, He refuses it, and He presses into the presence of the Father, and He has one question. Can those whom you have given me be with me where I am? That's all he wants to know. You are always on the mind of Jesus. There is never a time when he is not thinking about you. And all he wants to know is, can those whom you have given me be with me where I am? And the Father says, yes. And the Father embraces his Son for the first time in 33 and a half years. And this is found in the Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 3, page 202, that Jesus refused the homage of His people until He knew that His sacrifice had been accepted by the Father, and until He receives the assurance from God Himself that His atonement for the sins of His people had been full and ample, and that through His blood they might gain eternal life. And Jesus immediately ascended to heaven, presented Himself before the throne of God, showing the marks of shame and cruelty upon His brow, His hands and feet, but He refused to receive the coronet of glory and the royal robe, and He also refused the adoration of the angels as He had refused the homage of Mary until the Father had signified that His offering was accepted." And this is why Revelation chapter 12 says that the heavens should rejoice, but woe to the earth. Revelation 12, 10 says, Then I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of His Christ have come. For the accuser of our brethren, who accuse Him before our God day and night, has been cast down and say hallelujah this evening. 
And they, the saints, overcame them by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they did not love their lives to the death. And you know why? Because the lives that they were living led to death, and they found something better in the faith of Jesus. And in verse 12 it says, Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them, but woe to the inhabitants uh, and you who dwell in them, what did happen to the earth and the sea? For the devil has come down to you having great wrath because he knows that he has a short time again because it is finished. This victory made heaven, the angels, and even the redeemed more secure. A great reference for this is Signs of the Times, December 30, 1889, I believe. Signs of the Times, December 30, 1889. It's an article entitled, What Was Secured by the Death of Christ? Powerful, powerful stuff. Heaven and the unfallen worlds have made up their mind. They understand the love and character of God in ways they never could have otherwise. And now the case has been moved to our planet, to each individual human heart. And the question is, what decision are you and I going to make? Whose case are you going to believe? So if you've been wondering, can God accept me? Calvary says, yes! Yes and amen. You are accepted in the beloved, Ephesians 1 tells us. Jeremiah 31 and verse 3 says, The Lord has appeared of old to me, saying, Yes, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness, I have drawn you. The cross of Christ is like this divine magnet of grace. John 12, 32 again says that I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all to myself. But there's one more thought that came through my mind regarding the closing hours of Jesus' life, and then we'll close with some practical thoughts. But one more thought that on these Jesus' closing moments is that Jesus prays that the Father would forgive us. He says, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. But just think through what's going on in the mind and heart of Jesus. Throughout this experience from Gethsemane through the cross, Jesus is fully convinced in his own experiential mind that the heavens are as brass to his prayers, that the Father is nowhere to be found when he says, Father, please, Father, please, Father, please. And yet still in that context, Jesus prays to the Father, who seemingly doesn't, be, doesn't seem to be hearing his prayers, Father, forgive them because they don't know what they're doing. Guys, if that's not the faith of Jesus, what is? Jesus, in His agony and grief, still chooses to believe that the Father would bless you in answer to His prayer whenever He is not receiving the blessings of His own prayer. Are you hearing me this evening? The faith of Jesus on display. We're told this about that very prayer in Desire of Ages 745.1. That that prayer of Christ for his enemies embraced what? The world. Not just the redeemed, not just those who've said yes to Jesus. It embraces the world. It took in every sinner that had lived or should live from the beginning of the world to the end of time. Upon all rests the guilt of crucifying the Son of God. None are spared. And to all forgiveness is freely offered. And then it says, whosoever will, and pay attention to that when the song comes on after this, whosoever will may have peace with God and inherit eternal life. This also shows me that when God's special people at the end of time have received the faith of Jesus, that their focus is going to be outward. Outward. Jesus in his crippling dying moments when he's got a good reason to take a powder and just focus on me right now because it's kind of hard. Jesus is focusing on the thief on the cross who's pleading for mercy. Jesus is focusing on his mother and her care. And Jesus is praying for people who don't even care about what he's doing and may never care what he's doing. He's always looking outward because that's what the faith of Jesus does. It pierces through the darkness, it believes in the Father's love, and it even believes in the Father's love for people who are wholly undeserving. And it focuses on their needs above one's own, and God's people at the end of time are going to live a life that reflects that faith of Jesus. 
That's what receiving the faith of Jesus will look like. So we're told in Isaiah chapter 53 and verse 11 that Jesus shall see the travail or the labor of his soul and be satisfied. And by his knowledge, my righteous servant shall justify many and he shall bear their iniquities. So what does it mean? You are justified by his faith and he's satisfied. Christ went through all of this because he saw in you a pearl of great price. He saw a value in you again that you don't even see in yourself, and He's asking you to respond with a reciprocating faith, and this is what Paul's talking about in Romans chapter 1, verses 16 and 17. He says, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, and now we know why, because it's awesome. For it's the power of God what draws us and keeps us to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek, for in it, in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith. Jesus is overcoming faith and His pursuing faith in us to faith, our reciprocating faith in Him. As it is written, the just shall live by faith, but in Habakkuk, in the original language it reads, the just shall live by Christ's faith, by the faith of Jesus. Guys, it's amazing. The two bookends for the three angels' messages are the everlasting gospel and the faith of Jesus. As you are preaching the three angels' messages, Seventh-day Adventist Christians, anyone who's watching this broadcast, I implore you on behalf of Jesus, when you are preaching the three angels' messages, please don't forget about my friend Jesus. He's the beginning of the message, He's the end of the message, and what's going on in Babylon is in opposition to this gospel message. The entire three angels' messages are about the gospel, and there are current events and present truth issues that we need to pay attention to. I'm not downplaying any of that, but if the bookends of this thing are the gospel, then I bet, I'm, I'm just guessing here, that everything in the middle should have the gospel too. Amen? Amen. A suffering Messiah who perseveres through his faith and who gives that very same faith to his people, which is going to propel them to preach that gospel to the whole world. We cannot lose sight of the context of the three angels' messages. Again, Revelation 14, 12, here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Notice, not faith in Jesus, the faith of Jesus. Testimonies from the Church, Volume 2. Many who profess, I love this quote so much, many who profess to be Christians become excited over worldly enterprises, and their interest is awakened for new and exciting amusements, while they are cold-hearted and appear as if frozen in the cause of God. Here is a theme, poor formalist, which is of sufficient importance to excite you. Eternal interests are here involved, and upon this theme, the theme of the cross, it is sin to be calm and unimpassioned. The scenes of Calvary call for the deepest emotion, and upon this subject, you will be excusable if you manifest enthusiasm. Amen? Amen. There's a beautiful quote. The Ellen White wrote, this is actually, I just found this out not long ago. This is the last letter that we have access to that Ellen White wrote to somebody uh, in release in release writings that we have, uh, encouraging a very discouraged Christian. The Lord has given me a message for you, not for you only, but also for other faithful souls who are troubled by doubts and fears regarding their acceptance by the Lord Jesus Christ. His word to you is, fear not, for I have redeemed thee. I have called thee by thy name, thou art mine. You desire to please the Lord, and you can do so by believing His promises. You want to make the Lord happy? Believe what He says about you. He's waiting to take you into a harbor of gracious experience, and He bids you, be still and know that I am God. She's coaching someone in how to live out the faith of Jesus. You've had a time of unrest, but Jesus says to you, come unto me, and I will give you rest. And then she says, the joy of Christ in the soul is worth everything. And then are they glad because they're privileged to rest in the arms of everlasting love. Another note to a discouraged Christian, the message from God to me for you is, him that cometh unto me, I will in no wise cast out. And if you have nothing else to plead before God but this one promise from our Lord and Savior, you have the assurance that you will never, never be turned away. It may seem that you're hanging upon a single promise, but appropriate that one promise and it will open you the whole treasure house of the riches of the grace of Christ. Cling to that promise and you are safe. 
Him that cometh unto me I will in no wise cast out, and listen to this, present this assurance to Jesus, and you are as safe as though inside of the city of God. If you have nothing to offer Jesus but this promise that he who comes unto me I will in no wise cast off, that's enough. In that moment you are as safe as though inside of the city of God. The faith of Jesus, it is talked of but not understood. What constitutes the faith of Jesus that belongs to the third angel's message? Jesus becoming our sin bearer that he might become our sin pardoning Savior. He came to the world and took our sins that we might take his righteousness. And faith in the ability of Christ to save us amply and fully and entirely is us receiving the faith of Jesus. Listen to this powerful quote from E.J. Wagner, one of the great gospel preachers of the late 1800s. God chooses men not for what they are, but for what He can make of them. And there is no limit to what He can make of even the meanest and most depraved if they're only willing and believe His Word. Now, I want to close with this idea of what happens when we reject this precious message um, in Jesus' efforts to save us from our sins. Everlasting covenant. And so it went throughout the plague, speaking of, G- of Egypt. All the steps in each case are not recorded, but we see that it was the long suffering and mercy of God that hardened Pharaoh's heart. The same preaching that comforted the hearts of many in the days of Jesus made others more bitter against him. The raising of Lazarus from the dead fixed the determination in the hearts of the unbelieving Jews to kill him. The judgment will reveal the fact that. Everyone who has in hardness of heart rejected the Lord has done so in the face of the revelation of His mercy. Not one soul will pass to perdition without encountering the grace and goodness of God. So if anyone's going to be lost by taking the road to perdition, they're going to have to trip over my dead body to get there, Jesus says. I'm not letting you go down without a fight, He says. Now, remember Matt Parra when I was at Arise, he actually preached on this at ASI some years later, but he said, why would God choose to believe in people that don't seem to put out? Why would He do that? Then he says, what God knows doesn't change who He is. And love believes all things, it hopes all things, and it endures all things. Beloved, that message has to go to our world. That's your calling to receive and live out the faith of Jesus, to preach the faith of Jesus, and to see people not for what they currently are, but for what Jesus can make of them and to treat them accordingly. Amen? That's our call. God in heaven, that's our plea today, that you would give us that burden for lost souls. God, I pray that people who are hearing this, who are wrestling, could God accept me and love me? Lord, I pray as they're taking a moment to listen to Neville sing this precious song, that you would speak to their hearts and that we would find our hearts strangely warmed And we'd find ourselves saying yes to Jesus, the love of our lives. That as the Spirit and the Bride says, come, that we would drink of the water of life freely. Forgive their sins, cover us all with the blood of Jesus, and fill us with your Spirit, I pray. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.
Have you been blessed? D came tonight with an army of angels, and I praise the Lord. He did not let D down. Wow. What to say after that? But we do have a poll question, and I just want us to go through that question and look at some of the answers, and hopefully they were thoughtfully um, prayed over and the answers became clear as Dee preached tonight. So if we can have those poll questions up. What does Jesus, what does the faith of Jesus mean to you? Obviously the answer is all of the above from what Dee spoke to us about tonight. Jesus' obedience to death, even the death of the cross. Jesus' absolute trust in and dependence on his Father. Jesus lived and was victorious by faith. This faith emanated from his love for us, e all of the above. I have a couple of, actually, everybody got that right. Wonderful, praise the Lord. I pray that as I'm going to go through some quotes, one of which Dee um, spoke about tonight, but I pray that as we look at the, th the three angels' messages, we see in that the answer to what's going on in the world today. We have racism, we have strife. The only answer is the three angels' messages. And so I pray that we as Seventh-day Adventists, as we see these things happening, that we get on our knees and ask the Lord to help us understand the message that God gave our church. If I can have the rest of the slides up, I'd appreciate it. The faith of Jesus, unfortunately the numbers are over it, is, I think it's spoken about, but not understood. What constitutes the faith of Jesus that belongs to the third angel's message? Jesus becoming our sin bearer, that he might become our sin pardoning savior. We recognize tonight what it took for him to be our sin bearing savior. He was treated as we deserve to be treated. He came to our world and took our sins that we might take his righteousness and faith in the ability of Christ to save us amply and fully and entirely is the faith of Jesus. The Apostle Paul said this in Galatians 2.20. If you look at the King James Version, I'm crucified with Christ. The Apostle Paul rejoiced. Nevertheless, he said, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. The emphasis on, is on Jesus' work. We will not look at the rest of the slides. I want us, as we go back to our rooms tonight, to reread the three angels' messages and recognize that justification by faith is in the third angels' messages. We will continue tomorrow with delving into the three angels' messages. We will have a wonderful Sabbath school class. Mark Finley will lead us with a blaze with God's glory. You do not want to miss it. Please join us at 9 o'clock tomorrow morning. God bless you.